Idea has made our business millions of dollars. Um, as I said earlier, we, I started it in the basement studio apartment, Harvard Square. I had less money in my bank account than I owed for rent that month. And I started an ultra wealthy investor club, right? It was really a blog on the first day. And then the blog, by the time I got a, another job from the job I just quit, raising capital as a placement agent, before I got the next job offer, the blog started bringing in 5,000 a month, 7,000 a month in advertising, I started getting 3,000 hits a day to the website. Uh, one of my attorney friends said, hey, you don't have five kids and a mortgage like me. Why don't you just start the business and just go for this and not take that job offer? You can go back and take that next year if you need to. So I said, okay. Uh, and everyone else was telling me to take the job. I did that and then everything took off from there and we bought familyoffices.com and wrote one of the first books on family offices with Wiley. Then we wrote a book with Bloomberg. Then we wrote the first book on single family offices and yada yada. But a lot of it comes down to this idea of choke points, which I got from Eben Pagan, who recommended I read a book by Vern Harnish, who's the founder of EO. Um, and the, the book is called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. So this one idea I thought was the most powerful thing I could share with you. Uh, my goal is that someone in here uses this in the next year, you know, is making seven figure returns off the idea I share here today. And you don't need to hire me as a consultant to do it. I'm saying give you all all the examples you need right here to implement uh, this strategy in your family office, in your business units. Um, just spending, if you've read Keith Cunningham's book, um, The Road Less Stupid, he talks about thinking time. If you just spend thinking time or exercise time thinking about this, you just keep on getting more and more returns from it. So uh, I mentioned a little bit my, about my background earlier, um, but now I'm gonna be sharing many examples of strategic choke points and explaining what we do. So you see it through a different light. And at our investor club workshops and masterminds, we often talk about how whatever niche you're in, whether it's running McDonald's in a certain industry or cannabis companies or multifamily properties, whatever it might be, if you don't build walls around it, then it's easy for other people to compete with you. If they look at what you're doing, they say, oh, I could run a better family office club than Richard Wilson. Let me just wander over here. A toddler could enter your sandbox and make your life harder. Um, they should look at it and see something like this, right? They should see, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't compete. Maybe we need to go to the side a little bit and not be direct competitors with that person. That's what you want to have happen. The other way to think about the benefits of a choke point, uh, as my mentor Evan Pagan I mentioned earlier, is you want to think about how do I make it inevitable that you get more of the thing that makes your business go and less of whatever is most painful in your business. So it could be more distribution for your product. It could be more capital. It could be more customers. It could be more media exposure, whatever it is, more information if you're a hedge fund trader, perhaps. So how do you make it inevitable that you double in size or grow 10 times the net worth? And that's another way to think about choke points. Uh, who in here has seen the movie 300? So almost everybody. So in the movie, you know, there's a narrow canyon. You can only fit two people side by side. And this army of 300 defends against five or 10,000 soldiers. They do so because they found a choke point. And if they can defend that point, they can just kill the two people coming through there. Uh, and those people are vulnerable trying to come through that choke point. In the Middle East, 30% of the world's oil goes through here. So right here is military bases from every major country in the world. And because they don't want any one country to stop the flow of oil through that area, right? So if you control the most painful thing in your business and everyone complains about the cost of oil going up or transportation or something else, and you control that, then you can press that upon your competitors and either put them out of business, make them partner with you, make them do what you want to do and just make things go a lot faster. Um, we have dozens and dozens of examples of this. And so the reason I had you tear out the second to last page of the, the workbook, I don't know if you got one, Robin, I can get, get one for you here, but, um, second to last page is the one you can tear out. But basically, <clears throat> if you can come up with one or two or three that don't cost anything or are easy to start with, then it'll give you a lot of momentum. And in the exercise, I have a picture of a Jim Collins flywheel and then a sandbox you're trying to dominate. And at the beginning, you're just trying to get the, turn, the, the flywheel to turn over one or two times. Truth is everyone here in the room has a lot of momentum already in your business. So this would be if you're starting a new business or just whatever current momentum you have will get sped up by the first choke point you put in place. Then the second one, the third one will spin the wheel more and more. And the idea is you get the flywheel spinning so fast as a 10,000 pound piece of metal that it would just crash through any brick wall because you have so much momentum. And you can do that by obtaining choke points that once you obtain it, 
others can't obtain it because now you own it and you're not going to sell it because it's so helpful to you and your business. So one example is me taking 12 years to buy the asset I talked about this morning, billionaires.com. Why didn't Goldman Sachs or Blackstone own that? They all work with billionaires. They didn't care about having the most educational, helpful website in the world or Fifth Avenue real estate address for, for providing education on billionaires. I don't know. I shouldn't be able to own it, right? I have a 20 person company, right? So um, another example um, of a choke point is last year, we acquired the number one social media asset in dentistry. So we have 320,000 members in 200 social media groups. And so half um, or about a, a fifth of our 2.5 million followers on social media are in the dental space. So we get tons of dental deal flow, dental investors, and we can use those for real estate deals, dental deals, medical deals, et cetera. And once we own that social media asset, we aren't going to sell it um, because it's just helpful to our business long term. Uh, in Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, they talk about how Rockefeller became the wealthiest person in the world, not because he was an oil tycoon, but because he used the strategy of choke points. So he basically said to himself, okay, there's all these oil producers out there. How am I going to beat them? My biggest cost and headache is getting access to the oak barrels to actually ship the oil. So he went out and bought the oak barrel company that was the largest one. It helped him reduce his costs. He raised the cost of all his competitors and served himself first. Then he bought all the other oak barrel companies and basically controlled the whole oak barrel uh, business. Then he found that as an oak barrel company, the few people who wouldn't sell out to him, they were all competing for the oak wood. There wasn't enough oak being grown in the world for all the oak barrel companies. So he went out and bought oak groves and planted oak groves and controlled the supply of oak to the barrel companies. And other people weren't integrating and vertically integrating like that at that level. He then found that if he dried the oak wood, his barrels weighed a fourth of what everyone else's oak barrels weighed, and then his cost of transportation went down. So this strategy worked so well, he's one of the reasons why they created anti-monopoly rules. But since Amazon hasn't been sued for anti-monopoly, I highly doubt someone here in this room is going to, but you never know. So talk to your lawyer before you take a breath in the United States, as Joel mentioned this morning. Um, but basically the point is that this works so well that at the extreme, it almost breaks capitalism because you just control the distribution in your niche industry. Um, and so we had one person at one of our workshops said, oh, that sounds so mean. It sounds like you're hurting other businesses. And I was like, well, if you're doing good in the world, you should want your business to grow so you can help your employees and improve their lives and you know, do well by growing your business, right? Um, so we're assuming everyone runs their business in that way, as I'm sure you do. So um, there's all different types of choke points that you can acquire. It could be you know, like Olympus uh, invests in multifamily properties. It could be that he's identified a certain niche, whether it's a tax incentive that, that really helps him. And maybe there's only three consultants in the United States who specialize as an attorney in that tax area that he could get flow from. It could be a trustee in the state of Kentucky if he wants to buy apartments in Kentucky. He knows all the estate people who are clearing out estates that have multifamily properties in it, and he meets with them once a quarter in person. Um, it could be that you sponsor a YPO or an EO or Tiger 21 chapter and you negotiate an exclusive sponsorship. So you're the only crypto group allowed to sponsor uh, YPO or Tiger 21 in the state of Texas because you're paying for that. As long as you keep paying, that's the agreement. It could be a nonprofit group full of investors or deal flow sources and you're the volunteer leader of it. And as long as you do a good job, you don't get displaced. Other times it could be IP, and by you owning the IP, somebody else can't own it. Right now we're negotiating the purchase of a finance company that'll double our exposure on social media uh, and really give us a huge edge over our competitors, which we already have a, a couple million follower edge over. Um, and so for your business, it'll be different than what it is for my business, but by the very nature of it, by the very definition of it, when you acquire the choke point, it makes it either impossible or hard for someone else to acquire it. And it makes everything go faster and it relieves the pain of your biggest cost or the thing that you value most comes in twice as fast, five times as fast. So uh, when I met Joel and I heard what he did um, and I heard it was an offshore trust and I did the keyword search volume because I'm a domain name nerd, you know, we bought offshoretrust.com and we had to follow up with Joe and actually do something with that. but. I would want Nagel Law to own OffshoreTrust.com and not some random person who might want to compete against the Nagels. And like, why not? Right? It's pretty inexpensive to get. And if someone is searching online for something and it's the exact keyword match with the domain name, you're going to get a better click-through rate if you know how Google AdWords works. Another example is in the multifamily office world, there's thousands of multifamily offices. 
then there's something called an outsourced chief investment officer. That used to be a new concept, you know, 15 years ago. Well, now there are a couple hundred OCIO firms. They aim at endowment funds, big institutional family offices, pension funds. But that space is getting crowded and they're fighting to get attention to family offices. Um, so we try to separate ourselves by owning virtualfamilyoffices.com. If people want to set up a virtual family office, then that's a position that we have in the space. Went over to that example, mentioned a couple of those examples. Uh, one, some of these examples cost almost nothing. Um, with some family offices, just the positioning around the brand, if they want to get access to dry cleaners because they made their wealth in the dry cleaning business and having the name of their family office not be Wilson Capital, but be strategic dry cleaner capital or whatever it is, something that doesn't sound so clunky, but gets you the type of deal flow you want to get, then once you're using that name in commerce, it can help defend it against others trying to invade that space. And that costs nothing to do. It's just being intentional. Uh, an example, it does cost money. I was in Berlin at a super return conference uh, about 15 years ago, and I sat next to someone having coffee and they said they had a family office client that went to Africa where people had thousands of acres of land. They didn't have the money to pay for half a million dollars of mineral rights surveying airplane equipment and the cost of all that. So what they did instead, um, and the farmers would not know where the minerals were in their land. And so what the family office did is invest in the plane and the surveying equipment. And then they would go to the landowners and say, okay, well, I know you don't wanna pay half a million dollars to find out where the minerals are. Why don't you just pay us $20,000 for the price of gas? That's our variable cost. We have the sunk cost of this airplane, a one-time cost, and then you'll pay our variable cost. Any minerals we find, we share in 7% of those revenues or 7% of what comes out of the ground. And in that way, with one investment, they picked up all these mineral right royalties versus going out and trying to negotiate with the farmers and buy their land. They don't know if it's a good investment or not. So they were solving the pain point of the agricultural owners that they didn't have the money to find where the mineral rights were. And so they were smart in obtaining that and finding that. In our family office club business, if we can be the source of providing capital to a medical practice, then we can gain 5% or 20% or 50% equity sometimes in medical practice because we're solving their pain point of finding them capital through owning family office club, which is the exact same thing. We build it one time, we can use it to pick up multiple equity stakes in many companies. Uh, and many of you could do the exact same thing. It came up earlier on uh, Robin's panel, they were talking about how they source local deals and the lack sometimes of local capital for venture capital came up on another panel. And if you position yourself as the person to go to first, like Oprah Winfrey getting the Weight Watchers deal or Warren Buffett getting deals, everyone wants them to take their money because they're so strategic. And so, or Richard Branson type. And so if you position yourself to be the number one person to see deal flows first exclusively and at better valuations, because you don't just bring money, you're not just bringing a checkbook, you bring your intelligence to the table. And like uh, Michael and his niche, he could help scale the business much faster. And anyone has a checkbook, there's 70,000 people worth $100 million, but how many people could invest in a med spa with four locations and they've already scaled one 40 locations and sold it to private equity? Not that many people. So if you're that person, you need to be found first and you need to put the word out there that you have that expertise. And that's why Mike said they get access to these deals where they're buying a thousand acres with 1.5 miles of beachfront because people know them. And if Mike likes the deal and they negotiate the terms in El Salvador with the Bitcoin you know, originator there, then nobody else gets to even smell that deal. The deal's done, right? And so the best family offices that grow their wealth exponentially dominate a sandbox area and they get first look at all deals. And then the junk deals or the deals that aren't amazing go to the next family office down the line, the next person in their network, and then so on and so on. But people want more than just a checkbook. They want strategic value. So being super clear about your value as a private equity group, as a company, if you're going to acquire other companies, um, that's how we get really great deal flow for our families. And one of my families is in the auto parts industry. They sold their business for $180 million dollars. And they said, okay, well, we're going to go do it again. We're going to buy 10 companies, million dollars plus EBITDA each. We'll wrap them up and put a bow on it, sell it to private equity. Um, I said, well, if it was me, um, I wouldn't go out and just buy 10 companies like that. I would say, okay, what's the trend in aftermarket auto parts? It's people going to autoparts.com direct to consumer instead of O'Reilly's on the corner. Um, or it's going on Amazon and buying an auto part. So why don't we go to Amazon? and buy a top five auto parts distrib distribution company 
and go buy autoparts.com, you'll have a top five distribution on both areas. You could go to an auto parts expo conference in Vegas or New York and buy half of the conference, 50% equity or just 5% equity. So you get special access, get to see who all the vendors are, put your guys up front and not have them pay hundred K per booth or something. That'd be another example of a choke point. But by doing those things, what you could then do is go to anybody at that expo and let's say you owned it. You could say, oh, by the way, um, I own this expo or I help run it. And we could help you because we know all the vendors here with all these relationships. That alone would be impressive. But let's say you didn't. You could go to them and say, oh, by the way, uh, I don't think we stock you on autoparts.com, but we do sell you through Amazon right now. If you let us invest, I, I don't know if you guys are looking for capital, you're probably at an $8 million, $10 million valuation. If you let us invest at $6 million, we could double your EBITDA in 12 months and we'll put you at the top of the website. And you'll be the exclusive aftermarket muffler that we sell or we'll put you at the front or we'll do special promos for you. So when you can double somebody's revenue, they're going to give you a better valuation. And it just makes way more sense. You not only know the business, you can heavily influence the business. So if they bought on a top five website, a top five Amazon company, and then just five companies, I would bet that they would get a better result with maybe a third less capital expenditure and they would be able to you know, skyrocket in terms of their balance sheet because it's not just once they did the deal, it goes better. They can play defense, they can play offense, and they source deals exclusively. They know what's selling, they know what new trends are coming. Um, so that's one of my favorite examples of a choke point. And I think that's at the level that most of you here in the room can play is thinking about that strategically. So that's why I have the handout in front of you. So you could think about one or two or three choke points. It could be a real estate broker in mobile homes, if that's what you're interested in. And there's three of them nationally that just dominate. Well, maybe you could buy 10% of their brokerage, or maybe you could go to them and say, what's the fee that everyone pays you? 2.5%, 3%. We'll pay you 4%, but we want a 30 minute first look before you send this out on email to everyone else. And we only get to put our hand up on one deal every six weeks or something, but then we'll pay you 4% to give us that first look more than everyone else will pay you. Cause if it's an amazing deal, who cares if it's 3% versus 4%, right? At the end of the day, you don't want to miss like the whopper of a deal and have it go out to everyone and turn into an auction. So that's just an example for some real estate people here in the room. So we did this. Luckily, um, Evan Pagan, Vern Hartnish taught me this really early on <clears throat> when we had nothing. So, you know, we became the number one website, in the family office space, which wasn't hard. Cause there was like 10 of those in 2007. Um, became the number one largest registered network uh, or association of family offices in 2009. We then had the best selling book in the industry uh, in 2010 and 2015 again. Um, by 2012, we owned 42 different LinkedIn groups. Um, that all helped propel us and start um, filling up our conferences. We then had the number one conference series in the industry. And because of that, we started really growing in credibility, deal flow, connections. Um, and then everything continued from there of acquiring commercial real estate.com, billionaires.com, um, and all the other examples I talked about. Peter Thiel was brought up earlier on the VC panel. He says that when you find some opportunity and you think it's going to be a huge opportunity and others don't see it, then you really have to have the courage to double down on that thing. Cause that'd be, that could be your best idea. That's most impactful. And others are just blind to how inevitable this huge idea is going to be. And so he said, that's the closest you can get to predicting the future is really going for the thing that everyone around you says that you're, you're being dumb, that this, you know, you're out of your mind. This doesn't make any sense. Those are sometimes the most powerful ideas you can act on. And sometimes a choke point is not going to make sense to other people because you know the market dynamics and you know it's going to get you amazing deal flow or you know it's going to really help cut your cost down or help in some other way. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's many opportunities in business where you can do something and it's not a direct instant result. It's long term growing your influence, long term growing your momentum in a space. Those are the types of ideas we like to think about and, and work on. We don't like to do anything that puts us in competition with 10,000 other people. Um, I like to try to do something different, a different business model than what we'd be competing with on everyone else. Um, so I wanted to take a couple minutes to take questions, maybe examples, maybe help someone interpret this and use it for their business. Um, yes. Uh, when you say that you bought commercial real estate.com, billionaire.com, yeah. all the parts do you mean yeah. the domain name or some website and content? And how often right. do you yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah, I've got uh, 770 domain names. Only 50 of them are worth anything. The other ones are defensive or super niche or just related to 
projects of my clients, et cetera. Um, so we haven't bought autoparts.com. I suggested those strategies to the family and the father was 78 years old and thought I was crazy. And the son is keeping in touch. And one day I think I'll work with the son when he's in charge of the family office. But we're not uh, the owner of that one. That was just a strategy we identified for them. Um, but with billionaires.com, commercialrealestate.com, we took over a decade, like 12 years to negotiate those. Other ones like familyoffices.com, we bought early on for cheap, uh, luckily, right? <laughs> uh, some, like one of them we tried to buy last week, it was $95,000 last year, and now they won't sell it for less than a million dollars. And I told my assistant, like, oh, I knew I should have bought it last year. You know, the prices just fluctuate randomly, but in general, they go up. During COVID, more people did business online because they had to, but a lot of people here in this room uh, are not 75 or 80 years old, but the average chairman, the average CEO of really big companies, you know, most of those people, unless they live in California, are not 45 or 55 years old. When everyone right now is who's 45 to 55 years old, and we all built our businesses using heavy digital media, when we're all 60, 65, we're all going to be the chairmen and CEOs of the biggest companies in every industry, and we're not going to use domain names less, right? They're, you know, Supreme Court, trademarkable, et cetera. So um, we don't do it all the time, um, but if we can pick up the exact match for something that we're working on, then why would you not, right? It's like, sometimes it's like a one-time cost and I have a marketing advantage forever. Like we own investorclub.com. There's like 10,000 investor clubs in the world. I don't know how we bought that for like 20,000 bucks. I was like, all right, you know, if we get one deal done, it more than paid for yeah, investor it's club. Yeah. It's very rare to see someone uh, like you on the business side with this kind of vision because I've been right. in this industry for, Twelve years, and I really? always trying to convince people why yeah. they're buying this as, as an asset right. rather than investing. You know, yeah, yeah, market. yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. I, I, I love because I've benefited from it so much. It's like people say, "Oh, well, why are you? Why'd you go back? And why'd you buy another domain name? Or why'd you, why'd you write your thirteenth book?" It's like, well, because every time I do it, I make more money. If it didn't work, I wouldn't buy more domain names, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So in the medical space, we actually have. Um, the largest portfolio of single word domain names, I think of anyone. We have uh, dermatologist.com, immunologist.com, parasitologist.com, geriatricians.com, and a whole bunch more that'll bore you if I rattled them all off. But uh, we bought anyone that was reasonably priced, we bought them all up uh, last year, just because we have long-term conviction that people want to find the best doctor in their area. They're going to use the internet to do so. So why not capture some of the 500,000 people a month looking for a dermatologist? And a lot of those keywords have gone up 50% in volume just the last three years alone. So we think again, another decade, they'll go up even more. Yeah. Anyone struggling to see how this applies to you at all and think I just wasted 30 minutes of your life and I could like uh, come up with some practical example just to make it more helpful? Sure, well, like I know, um, you know, someone here in the, the room is a, in the franchise business, right? And I don't know whether they wanna buy more franchises or sell it, but let's say they did want to buy more and let's say the best deals got done with someone who's retiring because they they need to sell um so if they could secure uh a relationship with the head person the franchisee head the franchisor head and let them know like hey is it possible just to make sure we have a smoothness of operation and you don't have stores drop or have bad financial results in your system um, we're in acquisition mode and would it be possible with your permission to find out who's over 80 years old and owns a franchise in your network and I'd like to go fly there and just meet with them in person just plant the seed and put a face with the name and and then maybe sometime in the next five or ten years the kids don't want to run a Dairy Queen right maybe that they don't maybe that's not their goal in the world to run a bunch of Dairy Queens right so that may or may not be something applicable in that industry it might not be how it works that it might be carefully protected territories etc but uh, I think strategies like that make it more practical perhaps like how do you lock up the first look ability or how do you lock up um customers coming in or clients coming in the other way i look at it is how do you hit somebody between between the eyes with a brand so laser focused they say oh that brand is for me so um a brand like uh doctor's family office or doctor's investor club for work when we work with doctors um when we bought the dental social media asset, it was called Dental Peeps. I decided it was a weird name. So we changed it to Dental Club, kind of professionalized the logo, professionalized the website. Um, and then we're encouraging the, the dentist to be part of the dental club. It just seemed like a better positioning to have like the largest club of dentists out there. So um, for me, a lot of it comes down to how do we get tons of deal flow, lots of capital, 
um, and a lot of medical practice related work and, and deal flow. We helped one single family office create their brand and they were very private. So what we did is we registered a domain name and our name, not theirs. And we called it the Miami family office because they were wanting to relocate there and get local deal flow. And now every week we still have people reaching out with deal flow in the South Florida area, just because for free, we chose a brand name, the Miami family office, instead of Wilson capital or HBC capital. And no one knows or ever asks what HBC stands for, if that's what you name your family office. So it's just a worthless name. If you don't position the name under something that attracts something to you, but a lot of family offices get hung up on that. And they're like, Oh, well, we don't only want to invest in dry cleaners. So it's weird if we have that name, we don't only want to invest in, Miami area and they get all hung up on that. But if you choose some generic name, well, now you're getting no deal flow first, unless you just work that much harder to say, yeah, our name doesn't really mean anything to strangers, but here's our one liner. Here's what we're focusing on. We only do crypto. So we're big believers in just being super clear in your messaging. Um, we had family office club as a brand, but we started offering some private equity related conferences. So for like one quarter, we rebranded to Wilson conferences and like no one cared. No one wanted to come to a Wilson conference. We put it back to family office club and then people started coming again. So it's not about, it can't be about you. It has to be like about what people are looking for and then hit them between the eyes with something that says this, this is what you're looking for. And we're an exact match for what you're just searching for. So come on in and then, you know, we'll serve you as a business. So the idea here again, is that one choke point might be free for you to acquire. Or it's just a negotiation to having it be an exclusive sponsor or pay someone an extra percentage or two for showing you a deal a day early before they send it out to a thousand clients it might cost you nothing. Something else might cost you half a million dollars or a million dollars to acquire. I mean, almost everyone in this room is wealthier than me. If I can buy billionaires.com, you guys could do much bigger things or even more powerful than whatever niche you're in. And that can be more momentum all towards trying to dominate a very niche specific sandbox that you're trying to build walls around long term. That's the goal, but you know, I'll be here the next couple of days. So if anyone wants to chat about it over dinner or brainstorm on ideas, I think about this stuff for fun all the time. And it's actually, uh, this is one of two tricks I have for when I meet a hundred million dollar or a billion dollar family, and you know, you have one sentence to catch their attention. I either tell them how, as they're growing, we can structure a deal. So they give away no equity, get the capital they need from investors and not get diluted as they grow. Or I use this concept. And, and I look up their business before I meet and I try to think of a choke point for them. So when I meet, I'm like, Hey, why don't we work on this? Or I know someone like this. Why don't we set up a JV or partner? And those two ideas give me instant respect with people, no matter what their net worth, because they instantly say, Oh, this is another entrepreneur. This guy, I could benefit just from chatting with this guy. So whatever I'm asking for first, I try to add value to them through, through this. So anyways, thanks for everyone's attention and uh, appreciate your time. Join the Family Office Club by visiting familyoffices.com. We look forward to seeing you at our next live event.